Hello, it's Paul McFadden and welcome to the Property Success Podcast. My goal with the podcast is to bring in guests that will inspire you and today's guest is going to be a great inspiration for you and I'll tell you why. Because a lot of people have this misconception that in order to be successful in property, you've got to be full-time working on your property business. And our guest today is a perfect example of someone who has done this alongside their main job. Now, not only that, he works crazy hours, he's traveling all over the UK and into Europe, and he still makes it work. And this is why I think you guys are going to love this. And my goal with the podcast is not only to inspire you, but to also to learn about people and their backgrounds, what they've been able to achieve, some of the challenges they've had, so you too can learn from that to be empowered to go out there and do it yourself. So, Today's guest is Paul McKim. Paul, how are you, sir? Very well, thanks, Paul. Yeah, how are you? Good, good. thank yeah, you, good. good. Th thanks for having me on. Yeah, no, it's an absolute pleasure. We were chatting right before we kicked things off, and I'm like, we need to pause here. This is good stuff. We need to <laughs> maybe chat I was getting into too early, too. <laughs> anxious to get going. <laughs> no, it's great. So what I like to do with these uh, podcasts, uh, Paul, is go back to um, the younger you, Mm -hmm. to find out a bit more about that journey. So why don't we start there, give us a bit of a, a background about the younger self and then bring us up to what you're doing now and then, of course, we can get into the property chat as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, how far are we going back? A very quick rundown, going back to, um, you know, I left school. Um, I started down the, the university path, um, when I started a degree, uh, technology and management, but I realised very quickly that that's not the route I wanted to go down. Um, so I'd done a year there and uh, decided I wanted to go into the world of work. I've always been a, a worker, if you like. I always just wanted to kind of earn money and bring in as much as I could. So, yeah, very quickly went into the world of work. Um, had a few jobs here and there, some I liked, some not so great. Um, and I found myself um, working for um, into a kind of plumbing and heating um, supplies merchant. Um, so went through that, worked in there for quite a few years and very quickly progressed from working in warehouse, working on a counter, working in the office, um, to becoming a branch manager at the age of 24. So at the time, I think I was the youngest branch manager in Scotland. So that was a kind of feather in my cap for there. Um, then went on to kind of more sales jobs while I was working in there. Um, although I was a manager, I was very tight to my desk and stuff. I liked being out talking to people doing deals essentially even the way back then and um, without realizing that's what I was doing so yeah I got into sales then probably about 25 26 um and since then I've, I've been sales based ever since um, through a couple of different companies in the plumbing and heating sector and for the last 10 years I've been a sales manager for an aluminium company the company's based in Portugal I'd look after all the customers in the UK um budget of about 15 million quid this year so it's quite a, a high pressure job um but I'm just out there speaking to people all the time, building relationships and, uh, yeah, making it work. Great. So you you travel all over the UK, don't you? Yes, yeah. I'm actually the only employee for my company in the whole of the UK. So uh, customers from Inverness to Land's End, pretty much, it's, uh, it's my responsibility. So, yeah, I can be anywhere at any given time. So that ties into kind of how I kicked this off because, you know, it's not like you've got all the time in the world to focus on your property business because, yeah. of course, you're employed and and um, and that's one thing, but it's also all the travel and, and everything else. Yep. Now, one of the things that, you know, I, you, you've opened, openly shared about before is that it wasn't as if that you, you've got a job that you hate. It's not as if, as much as that you want to build your property yeah. business and make that your, your main thing, which you're working towards, but it's it, you. You kind of also mentioned that you're in a, a position of comfort as well. Yes, I. I sometimes I think that works against me almost because <laughs> I've got myself to the position in my career where I've, um, you know, I'm reasonably successful at what I'm doing. Um, I've got a comfortable job. Yes, I travel a lot, and there's a lot involved in it. And um, but it's also given me a lot of things. You know, it's got to me to where I am in life. Um, it helped my wife and I get our first buy to let property, which we can go into later. But we kind of accidentally fell into it, if you like. Um, but without having the job and the security that I had to get me there, you know, it probably would have never happened. Yeah. What I love about you, Paul, is based on what you've been saying there, is that straight away from leaving university, you had that work ethic, wanting yeah. to get out into the workplace. And, and I feel like people who move into sales, that you, you get paid and a lot of your um, money comes from commissions and, mm -hmm. you know, building relationships and more importantly, you know, earning 
um, the value that you put into your, you know, whatever product or service that you're offering, and you've yeah. obviously done well at that. Yep. And uh, that work ethic tends to translate into anything else that you do in life. Absolutely, yeah. 100%. So when, you, when you've got that drive and that motivation, and uh, it's something that I think is is lost with a lot of younger people these days. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I've been in a job once before, and the managing director of the company um, got me and actually sat me down. They said, um, "So we've got all these new guys coming through. They seem really keen and all this, but then they kind of fall off the radar." He said, "What you do is, is you just go out. You're you're very tenacious. You know, you go after things all the time." He's like, "How do I teach that to younger people? How do we get?" you know, that instilled in our younger generation of salespeople coming through. And I'm like, I don't know if you can. I, I don't know if it's something you're born with or, or, or I just, yeah, I don't know. But I'm fortunate enough to be, my personality just kind of pushes me out there. And I just like going out and meeting new people and talking to people. And essentially that's how you end up being a success in sales. It's um, it's more about listening to people and, 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 you know, seeing what they need and then tailoring a solution from them. So Yeah, if you look at today's day and age, where the, the future generation, like you would phone somebody, let's say you were to phone someone who's in their late teens or early 20s, you phone them, they won't pick up the phone, instantly they'll send you a text message or a WhatsApp, yeah. what's up? Yep. That's the problem. Yeah, that's exactly. the problem. 100%. Even going back, when I started in sales, mobile phones weren't a massive thing, you know, I'll show my age a bit here now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I had a mobile phone, but not everyone I was dealing with had mobile phones. You know, I'm talking about going back to the days where you didn't just have Google Maps on your phone to find where you were going. You had the old paper maps down the door. No, <laughs> um, so all the communication was verbal. You know, you would pick up the phone and phone someone's office to make an appointment to go and see them, and then sit down in front of them and have the conversation. But nowadays, as you say, you know, people pick up the phone; they, they want to text you, yeah. you know, or, or get a voice note, something like that, rather than talk to you face to face or even on the phone. It's um, Different, different world now. Yeah, and and in some cases it's it's been beneficial and it's been great. 100%. But in other cases, when you look at this, you can start to see the obvious things that um, that makes it a bit more challenging in terms of the work ethic, especially. And with what you've just said there about how you've been successful and what you've you've done yourself is building relationships. Yeah. And nowadays, if most is done over text messages and you don't have that face-to-face -face and spending time having deeper conversations, getting to know someone, and in the world of property, relationship building is one of the most vital things oh, that yeah. someone needs to develop. Absolutely. Because the world of property is actually quite small in the grand scheme of things. <laughs> yes. And relationship building can open up so many opportunities to joint venture with people, to do deals with people, to partner with people, to get all sorts of different collaborations and it's yeah. those that are able to communicate, build those relationships, take that time and energy because uh, sales in itself is communication. Yeah, that's all it is. That's how I see it. It's, uh, I used to say to people, I feel as if I'm just going out every day and making new friends. You know, I become friends with someone and they end up doing business with you. Not necessarily because your product's the best or you've got the best price, but because they want to buy from you, you know, and... I found when I started in sales, I noticed very quickly in, in my kind of peers and, my, and the other people in the team, there was two different types of salespeople. There was one, you know, people who would come in, complain, and they would moan, oh, I lost this sale, my price isn't good enough on this, I didn't get this customer. And then there's other guys that were, you know, absolutely flying. And so I wanted to then spend time with the guys that were flying to follow them and see, you know, what they do. And every time I would go out with one of these guys, you'd realise that they were just going in, you know, having conversations, they were really friendly with the people that we're going to see, not pushing anything on them, listening to what they were saying more than they were talking. And from that, they, you know, they were just getting orders. And it, people weren't even questioning price a lot of the time because they were buying from the person. And I thought, you know, that's, that's what I need to be. That's how I need to do it. And very quickly adapted my sales strategy, if you like. And um, I see that. I didn't have to adapt too much. It's, you know, it's, you could see it was an easy thing to do. So, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's yeah, it. if you can go get good at communication and, you know, just building those relationships, it can give you so much in the world of property for sure. Because mm -hmm. when people are starting out and, you know, they've got to be meeting people. Yeah. The way they communicate with an estate agent, mm -hmm. right? To put in an offer. Yep. Uh, the way they're communicating with a seller, you know, the way they're communicating with their builders, their brokers, communication yeah. is so often overlooked. But if we could just work on that and develop that, 
then that skill set's going to set you apart from many others. And I think that ties into the amount of deals that you've done, which we'll get into, yep. because you're kind of down a route of sourcing and selling deals on. And of course, mm -hmm. one way to get repeat business on that front and to secure deals is relationship building again. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I know a big, big part of the property world nowadays is social media, putting yourself out there. I'm the first person to say that I don't do enough on my socials. Um, I tend to do everything face to face, you know, like um, I, I do bits on socials. I, I, I know I should do more. Everyone I speak to, you know, when I have a chat and you catch up with people, they say, oh, Paul, you've done this deal, you've done that deal. You need to be putting that out there. And I'm like, I probably do. But then part of that is me kind of holding back a bit because, you know, I'm still in my day job. I want to, you know, need to keep that in mind as well that I've, my my main income at the moment is my day job, so I don't want to put too much out, out there on property. But most of what I do is kind of face to face, and it's just conversations that I have with people. So yeah, yeah. love it. So talk about your first buy to let because you did that before uh, you came along to do our our protege program, which I'd yes. love to get into. But your first buy to let, so you mentioned it's a little bit of an accident, or what? It was yes, I so um, my wife we weren't married then. My wife and I had a, a flat in Paisley. Um, we were kind of looking for somewhere a bit bigger, uh, needed a bit more space, but the right property just wasn't, we couldn't find the right house we wanted. Um, so to buy ourselves a bit of time, I said, why don't we rent somewhere a bit bigger just now? Rent out the flat that we were living in um, until we find the right house, then we'll sell the flat, you know, and we'll move in. Uh, so we done that. We very quickly found a house that we that suited what we needed, but it was, it was a rental. So we moved in there and uh, within a couple of weeks we had our previous property rented out. As soon as we moved to the house, we moved from um, Paisley to Coburnley. Um, so we're moving towns. It was about, adding on about an extra 20 minutes to my wife's commute to work and things. We thought, if it doesn't work out, it's only going to be short term. But where we moved to, we absolutely loved it. Um, we thought, what are we going to do? We, we don't want to rent forever. Um, so uh, we, st we thought we'll stay here for a wee while. Um, let some equity build up in the other house as well, which is what we've done. Uh, so over a period of a couple of years, we had conversations with the landlord. You know, would you consider selling the house? And they said, yes, but not now kind of thing. So all this time, we've still got our other property rented out and, and we still were on a repayment mortgage. So we're paying it down and paying it down. Um, and then we realised, you know, we're actually, we're landlords here. <laughs> this is us kind of a first step, if you like, into the property market because we, we then seen that when we did buy a house, we had enough equity in the flat that we'd be able to keep it. You know, we could release equity, pay the deposit down on our new house, and then and still keep the flat. So that's that's kind of how that happened. After a, a period, quite a few years, the landlord eventually decided to sell us a house, released equity from our, our old flat, still managed to keep it, bought our new house, and we still had the, the flat as well. So here we were, we had the house we were living in, plus we had a flat as well. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it worked out quite well for us. Um in the grand scheme of things, it's probably not how most people get involved in property. Um, although we're saying that maybe more people than you think get involved that way. But yeah. uh, that, that was our first step into the to the becoming landlords, if you like. Yeah, we have many accidental landlords come through the program, and yeah. I think it's by surprise, yeah. similar to yourself. Maybe they couldn't sell the house they were in, and they've moved into a, another home, or yeah. similar scenario to yourself. And then years go by. They see the equity grow because obviously property prices go up over time, yep. regardless of what happens in the market, even yep. downturns and everything else over the longer term that goes up. And the sooner someone can get started buying property, whether yep. it's their own home or investment purposes, allowing time, of yep. course you want to buy right and make sure yeah, you add yeah. value, all the kind of mm -hmm. you know fundamentals. But if they hold that property like yourself, you look back and go, oh my God, my property's gone up so much in value, I can actually utilise the equity there that the tenant that's currently in there paying rent Paid is going to yeah, cover yeah. the interest that I'm taking or the interest payment on the money I'm borrowing to then go and get a bigger home for myself or another investment. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it is. And I see we went from, you know, a very small flat to a much bigger four bedroom detached house kind of thing. And it was the money we'd made from that small flat that allowed us to, to buy that home Yeah, uh, that we're still in now. Building. Brilliant. <laughs> Love that. So uh, was Protege your first time coming across myself or did you come across, did you come yeah. to a property jumpstart event? Came or? to a jumpstart event, yes. I've been thinking more and more about getting involved in property um, because seen seen how we've done all right with the flat. So, and I've always been, that kind of way, I've always thought about, you know, what can I do long term? I've always liked the idea of, you know, 
you know, homes under the hammer thing. Everyone sees it on the telly. You know, you know if these people can make money out of it, you know, uh, I've got a bit of common sense. I like to think surely I could do do as good or better. Um, so yeah, I started looking into property education. Um, I think I must have clicked on one of your posts once, and then I, I couldn't get rid of you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, came along to a jumpstart event, and uh, yeah, from there signed up for Prodigy on the day. Yeah. So tell me a bit more about Prodigy because you did Prodigy about um, a year and a half ago. What yeah. there are thereabouts? January twenty three. Yeah. Brilliant. So what was your experience? How did you find it first and foremost? Uh, absolutely mind blowing to be honest. Yeah, it was uh, a jump start. Really gave me such a kick to to get going. I thought you know I really want to do this. Um, signed like I say signed up for Prodigy on the day and uh, came along to Prodigy and, and the whole week it was just. It completely changed my perspective on, on the whole property market. You know, having had one buy to let that we lived in, um, moved out of, earned some money from it, um, and kept that asset. The only way I could see to progress my you know property um, journey, if you like, sorry, would be to save up again, save up the deposit. You know, the old fashioned way, as I would call it. Um, but there's so many other strategies out there that I just I didn't know, and it opened my eyes uh, to what actually can be done. Uh, to making money from property that you don't even actually have to own, you know, by sourcing on deals and you know, assisted sales and all sorts of other things that just, it was a <laughs> open my eyes, absolutely open my eyes. Love it. And I, I want to hear more about the story because you took one of the marketing strategies, yep. um, my least um, favourite one, but still effective. It's which my was... least favourite as well, by the way, even though <laughs> after this story. It's one that everyone knows, which we'll, we'll, we'll get into. And the reason I, I say it's my least favourite is because there's other marketing strategies, of course, we, we talk about on the programme that is more effective and, and you know, yeah. it's something that I recommend that people do. But tell me a bit more about that because um, I think that's great in the sense of you applying that strategy yep. and quite quickly got a result. Yes, uh, so my first deal basically came about just under three months out of Protégé. I had um, I did my sourcing website set up as well. So straight after Protégé, I, um, I got my two websites set up. So the sourcing one was the first one to get up and running. I uh, went with bandit boards and leaflets. So I had bandit boards up around town, local towns and stuff like that. And I was delivering leaflets, but I was very... Having had a paper run myself when I was a young kid and... Uh, I never liked delivering leaflets. Uh, so they tend to get binned sometimes. I hope my old employers not watching. <laughs> I was really paranoid that I was going to spend all this money in leaflets and pay somebody to deliver them and they weren't going to work, uh, do it. So I basically delivered the leaflets myself. So I'm out. I had my wife out with the whole family out and sometimes delivering leaflets through letterboxes. Um, I think I must have done two or 3,000 the first time. Gave it four or five weeks and then started leafleting the second uh, the same area for the second time and it was absolutely bucketing down my rain I was out myself and I was thinking this doesn't work at all you know, <laughs> what's Paul McFadden told me here <laughs> um, but I thought no keep at it keep at it so I was delivering leaflets and uh, my phone started ringing completely out of the blue phone call and it was someone who had literally just put a leaflet through the door the day previous and that was the second leaflet they'd had and uh Long story short, it turned in to be to be my first deal. Um, they were wanting to sell the house, and yeah, I very quickly went round to see them. Love it. it you know, obviously, leaflets is my least favoured, but if people are consistent with it, yeah, as in the repetition. So you said it was the second leaflet that the yeah, yeah. the you know the homeowner got, because it's like anything when it comes to marketing. It's um, you know, someone to become motivated to sell their property. You know that motivation starts to build up. So if you were going to do the leafleting campaign, of course, we talk about this at Protege, yeah. you need to commit to it for a period of time, you yeah, know, yeah. three to six months and yeah. every three to four weeks delivering, you know, five to 10,000 leaflets in and around a specific area. Yeah. And if you commit to that, you know, you will you will get people reaching out. Yeah. And when it comes to sourcing off-market property deals, it's like a, a lucky bag. Yeah. You kind of don't know what you're going to get. Yeah, exactly. It could be... A distressed landlord wants to offload six properties, which you can go and get a, yeah, yeah. a cracking deal and build your portfolio like that instantly. Mm -hmm. It could be someone that you can't really help, but you can recommend them to an estate agent and get a thousand pounds commission. Mm -hmm. It could be a, a property that's got 50 grand profit as a flip. It could be a property that's perfect as an SA and it's in a great location where you yeah. can make 
two grand net income a month. Yep. So it's putting things into perspective. It's just a consistency in one form of marketing that could get results. Yeah. So that one there, was that a property that you added to your portfolio or did you trade it? What did you no, do? I traded that one on. Yeah, like I say, I was very, very early in my property career. I had um, not long put protege on a credit card. So my, my main thought was I need to get some money back in here and start paying back this money. Um, so I, I traded that one on. Um, I had actually been... <laughs> Think that it was really every, the stars kind of aligned for this one, if you like. So, the week previous to this, I had been at um, the Scottish Property Meet, and I had met an investor. I had connected with uh, someone who was looking for buy to let properties in that area. Um, it's, that's kind of one of the reasons why I, I, I was I went and targeted again the same area. I knew I had someone who who was interested in buying in that area as well. So. Yes, I, I traded that one on. I, I went to view it. I was absolutely soaked to the skin. So it was as quick as I could get home, get showered and changed and go do a bit of due diligence before I went out and have a look at the, um, had a look at the property. Um, yeah, and within literally two or three days, I had uh, an offer from the investor to, to buy the property. He, he took it on. Needed a small renovation. I think it was seven, seven and a half grand it was. Put a new bathroom in, uh, some decoration, new flooring. And um, it was good to go. But the, the people who had contacted me, um, they were going to get their house repossessed. Um, they were well behind the mortgage payments. They had a secured loan on the property as well. Um, and they had about five or six grand worth of credit card debts. So from what they owed, um, it was a case of just sitting down with them, figuring out what their situation was, not just how much I could get the property for, if you like. Again, it goes back to relationships and talking to people and understanding their needs. Um, it was a case of, right, how much do you need to clear the property? Your secured loan on it. What else do you need to clear your feet so that you're getting a fresh start? Um, and the offer I made them was a couple of grand on top of that, so they had a bit in their pocket as well, which was still a really good deal, you know, for my investor. Um, he spent seven or eight grand on it, managed to refinance it, you know, and get some money back out of it later on. Even without refinancing, he was happy with the deal that he got anyway, but he was still able to do that further down the line, and the homeowners got to got to kind of move on. And uh, so, roughly, how much did you make on that in terms of your own? I made mean, three grand. Three grand. Three grand one, yeah. So here's what I love about what you've just said there, right? You not only made money for yourself, yeah. you gave the seller exactly what they needed in a situation where they needed help yep. to clear off all their debts plus some over and above. Yep. The investor got exactly what they wanted. Talk about a win-win-win. Oh, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> and this is what I love about this game because... Uh, you know, what you did there was a, a property deal trade where you source a property and sell it on. And of course, you felt everybody involved. And it's a strategy that's often underlooked yeah. or doesn't even get acknowledged. But it's a great strategy to learn more about property yourself because you do your due diligence oh, yeah, and yeah. you get so the reps in, mm -hmm. go through the whole process, working with investors, going along to the Scottish property meet with yeah, um, yeah, Sean yeah. McIntyre, who's been on the podcast, one of my business partners who uh, runs the SPM and, you know, head over to scottishpropertymeet.com because networking is incredibly important. It goes yeah. back to building relationships. So again, Talking finding people, someone yeah, there exactly, to, yeah. to partner with and work mm -hmm. with. So it's um, straight out the playbook, which, uh, uh, which honestly, is what I love. Honestly, if I could have written my first deal how, how I wanted it to go, that's <laughs> that's what I would have written, to be fair. <laughs> Something very similar. So I was really lucky. Um, unfortunately, not all my deals have been like that. It's uh, I'd love to sit here and say that's how easy it is to do deals. Um, yeah. It's not. As you say, protege, you know, properties are a roller coaster. There's ups and there's downs. Yeah. That was an up. You know, there's obviously been downs as well. But yeah. uh, for, for a first deal to go through as kind of sweetly as that was, yeah. um, was, was really good. We'll get into the, the ups and downs because I think that's important for, mm -hmm. for people to be aware of and know as well because, you know... Um, it's like I had a chat just the other day there with uh, another investor who is going through a bit of a challenge. And, and one of the things that I said to her is, look, you need to understand that what you're going through right now is a moment. Yeah. Like this moment will pass. Yeah, yeah. And one thing that I know about property is if you can weather the ups and downs, as you evolve and grow yourself as a person, as in further educating yourself, developing your knowledge, getting more wins under your belt, no matter how small, yeah. overcoming the setbacks and objections and everything else. Yeah you know, you become a better person for it yeah. rather yeah, than um, allowing it to take you out the game. Mm -hmm. Plus, I then said to her, what would you rather? Would you rather go back to work? And she's like, absolutely not. I was like, exactly, yeah, exactly, exactly yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So you take the ups and downs. And yep. one thing I love about property, if you've got the right positive attitude and mindset and um, are continuing to look to grow 
yeah. and take each thing as a as a lesson learned and improve from it. Yeah, yeah. That's the recipe of having all the success that you could possibly have. You know, that just grown to be the next evolution of you. Yeah, absolutely. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Good. So um, that was your first deal. Must have got a whole bunch of confidence off the back of that. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I thought this is easy. <laughs> I can try to go and do the same again, <laughs> rinse and repeat. But <laughs> yeah. as you know, it doesn't always happen that way. Um, the second deal I found a bit more hard to come by. Um, continued with the same um, marketing. I started doing some Facebook ads as well. Um, and I was fine myself. I started to very quickly from the high of doing my first deal and everything being you know so easy, if you like. Um, to then really struggle to get my second one under my belt. Um, I then started looking back now. At the time, I didn't think I was doing anything wrong, but looking back now, I was I was looking at the wrong kind of deals and I was I was almost trying to force a deal to make it happen, if you like. So, oh, you know, if, if we get this, you know, if, this one, if I can get this one for 60, I'm sure I'll get 90 for it with a refurb. And, you know, you're, you're kind of trying to massage the figures to make something look like a good deal. And uh, when my next opportunity came to me, um, which came through my website, um, through after a Facebook ad that I had run, an inquiry came through the website, I'd, I'd done the very same thing. Uh, I went out and I try, almost tried to make the figures work. So I had the deal, but then I, I, I couldn't sell it because my, I don't know if it was my due diligence that was wrong or if I was just, like I say, trying to, to force the deal to work. Um, it wasn't. It, it didn't really work very well, and I, I got myself in a bit of a situation where I had a deal, but I didn't have anyone to buy it because it wasn't a good enough deal. So that was kind of from the high of the first one to the to the kind of the low. But um, you know, you learn from that. I, I learned probably more from the second one that didn't go through than I did from from the first one because the first one went so smoothly. So I then found myself in a situation where I, I thought, before I get another deal, I need to spend more time looking at investors and trying to kind of some money either money for myself lined up or have someone set up to buy it for the next time because the feeling where I had, you know, been to this, these people's houses, sat down in front of them, spoken to them, almost sold in the dream that I could solve all their problems very quickly to then realise I couldn't was, you know, put me in a, not a dark place as such, but, I, you know, I didn't like being there. So from then on, I, st I started to kind of switch my focus, if you like, to having trying to make sure I've got funding or investors in place before I then start making promises to people that I, I can't keep. So it was a kind of up and down and up. Um, so the next deal, I had an investor lined up um, and I've been outsourcing for the investor, um, using estate agents actually this time as well. But I still had my marketing going on in the background, but over the period of time, building up relationships with estate agents um, and it was through estate agents that my next, my next deal came. Love it. Now you have, do you know what's crazy about this here when you're talking about ups and downs? My first year in property, going back quite a bit right now, I um, traded two deals. My first deal trade, I made a thousand pounds. My second one, I made 1500 quid. Mm -hmm. So, in my first year in property, I made two and a half thousand pounds. So, your first deal made more than my two collecto. <laughs> and I bought my first buy to let. So, your first year though, um, you've done quite a lot of deal trades and you've also carved out a little niche down south, which we'll get to, but you've yeah. done roughly how many deals? Ah, uh, nine ten. So, so Deals, you've yeah. so so it just shows you that through the quick one at the beginning, your first mm -hmm. deal, then a bit more of a challenging second deal, which you yep. get lessons learned through that whole process. Yep. And you've only been in your journey for less than a year and a half. Yep. And you've already did around about ten deal trades, mm -hmm. and it just shows you that if you're learning from each. On to the next, you're getting more efficient, getting better, rolling with the punches as such. Absolutely. And that's all in less than a couple of years. Yeah, yeah. I know. Do you know what? I, I kind of put myself down a bit because um, when we, you know, we obviously when you go to Protege, you write yourself a letter um, at the end. Uh, when my letter came through a year later, I didn't open it. It was like because I felt as if I hadn't achieved enough to be able to. I knew what I'd written in there. And I was like, I'm not quite there. I'm not quite there. So I, I put it aside. Um, but actually, when I sat and I talked through, the, when I really got a realisation was when I came back and done Protege for the second time, and I was talking to people who were just there, just new on their journey, and they're asking me, you know, what have you done, and where are you, and you know, in your your property journey, and you start talking openly about it, a bit like what I'm doing here just now, I started to realise, I'm like, you know, I've actually done all right, you know, <laughs> for being a year, a year and a half down the line, um, I've actually done all right. I should give myself a bit of credit for it. Yeah. Um, and what's the most you've made on a deal trade? In a deal trade, probably most in a deal trade is about five grand. Good. 
All right, so, cool. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's like my first ever deal trade. Uh, I made what like a thousand pounds. Yeah. And then when you realise that, um, you know, when you get better at it, you can yeah. start charging a lot more, but mm -hmm. still makes it a win-win-win for the seller, yep. for yeah, the, yeah. the buyer as well as yourself. But it's just seeing where you can add more value in order to, um, I guess, make more money. Yeah, because yeah. the more money you're making, the more you can put into growing the business for yourself and everything else too, which is which is key. Now, uh, you carved out a little bit of a niche from working down south um, around the whole rent to SA strategy. Yes, yes. I have, uh, as a very recent, it's only been in the last five, six months that I've, I've kind of started to carve that out. Um, I got involved, I, I met someone through another kind of property networking group um, who was talking a lot about Rent to SA and he was based down south and Rent to SA is a strategy that doesn't really, you know, it doesn't work in Scotland, we've got the licensing makes it whole, you know, very complicated, you could be paying rent for months without being able to have anyone in the property so um, so I started to investigate a bit more down there um, and he sent me a couple of deals that, that he had kind of available and I had a bit of money sitting that from deal trades that I'd done and stuff, and uh, I thought it's not enough to do a big project at the moment. What I, what I had sitting there, so I thought if I can get into something a bit lower entry cost, um, what I'm really looking at is cash flow coming in, building up a kind of regular sustainable cash flow, and you know SA is a great cash flow strategy. Um, rent to SA, a bit less so because obviously you're paying more for rent than you would if you were buying it. Um, so anyway, I started speaking to this guy and I looked at one of the deals and I thought. That looks really good. Um, and the thing with rent to SA is the speed. You know, you can say yes to a deal and, and have the keys in a week time. Um, mm -hmm. Because there's no licensing down, um, Cardiff is where the, the first one was. Um, you don't have to go through a whole laborious process as long as the property is obviously compliant in terms of, you know, your your electrics, your certifications and all that kind of stuff. You can get, get going very quickly. Um, so within 11 days of me getting the keys to my first rent to SA, it was live and had bookings coming in. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it was uh, that was the first one. I wanted to understand the strategy and what was involved a lot more as well. So the first one was a just completely empty house. It was newly refurbished, um, one bed flat, and uh, it needed completely kitted out top to bottom. So I thought I want to do it myself. I want to do the first one myself and understand everything that's required so that going forward I'm well prepared. So three journeys backwards and forwards to Cardiff in eleven days. <laughs> one of them with my wife and my daughter down there round every home furnishing store in Cardiff, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> a couple of late nights, and um, we had the place all kitted out. And uh, after a day or two of being live, we got our first booking in. And uh, it was a great feeling. <laughs> and how, how's that doing for you in comparison to a t traditional buy-to-let? Uh, the first one just now, it's well, the first two months were 100% occupancy after I got my first guest in, which was crazy. Um, the nightly rates were pretty low. Um, the management company that was using, you know, dropped it down to get people in to get generate some good reviews and things like that and then start increasing the rate um which is what we've done now but in terms of cash flow i'm averaging about seven seven fifty a month after all bills from that one Brilliant. Um, so you know from a cash flow point of view i thought i don't have only put seven grand into that and that was including paying the sourcer uh, if i saw some fee down there um so it was seven grand in um so i'll have all my money out in less than a year um, and i've got a five-year lease on that one so after year one, you know, you've got all the money back in that you, you've put out there and it's, it's it's an infinite return on your investment, really, you know. So yeah, as long as you know you've got to have enough demand to cover the bills, whatever you make on top of that is is, is yours. It's free money, essentially. Yeah, I, I love that you're sharing this here because, again, it's it's often overlooked because most people just look at your traditional buy-to-lets or buy-renovate and sell a property yeah. and don't understand there's so many other strategies and all it takes is, like, for some people, two, three, four of those types of deals, yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's it. They've got in their head life changing money. Yeah. Like when you when you've got a, a few thousand pounds coming in a month, that's not working income. Mm -hmm. I don't like using the word passive income because clearly there's work required. Yeah, nothing's passive completely. Yeah, but the reality is you've it's set up and then forget as yeah, such. Yeah, pretty much. And you've got that income coming in, and. That there is a game changer for most people when they start to see it. So not only have you done it for yourself, but you've sourced it for other people too. Yes, I have. I so now of uh, the contact that I made, the pair, the guy who's my landlord down there, um, he's very well connected in the Cardiff property market. He does a lot of stuff. Um, there's loads of old Victorian houses down there um, that are prime for being 
um, developed into you know four, five, six smaller apartments. Um, he's well connected with people who are doing a lot of that stuff, so he's a, he's a constant supply of stock, if you like. Um, I was started talking about rent TSA up here, kind of my network and the protege community and stuff as well. And people were like, you know, that sounds great, just doesn't work up here. So I, I kind of I saw a bit of a niche and thought, mm. well, he's got the stock. I've got interest up here from people, you know, looking to invest. Why don't we work together, and collaborate on it? I said, send me any deals that you've got. Um, I'll put it out to my network up here. And uh, very quickly, I've grown. So I've added, since added another one, so I've got two down there now. And uh, I've sourced six or seven just within the protege community alone, um, plus another two or three um, separate to that as well, outside the network. So Outstanding. Yeah, so Outstanding. It's, it's really good. And that's all in the space of the last two or three months. Yeah. Yeah, I love so. it. I love it. Do you know what's great though, Paul, is that you have you've done the work. It goes back to what we were talking about in the the, yeah. the beginning of this year, just with that work ethic, mm -hmm. building the relationships, you know, tapping into the whole community in terms of the protege group and serving them by supporting and helping them and getting deals as well. And you know, and, and it's just it's just that approach that will is always gonna um help you become successful in whatever you decide to do. Absolutely. It's it's hard work, it's communication as well. I mean, I, I could have quite easily gone down to Cardiff the first time and, you know, had this guy introduced to me, you're like, I'm your landlord, okay, right, fine, I'll pay your rent every month, thank you very much, goodbye. So I thought, all right, great, so your land how many properties have you got? How long have you been, you've been investing? What else have you got? And from that conversation and listening to what he had then led to, you know, developing the relationship into kind of where it is now. Great. So what's the, because we're going to have you back on the podcast in about six months or a year from now for <laughs> sure, because I know you're doing so much that will be a lot more to talk about. But what's the, the kind of the goal for the rest of the year and maybe, you know, uh, the short term next couple of years? What's the goal for Paul? Uh, the goal for Paul, I, I, I do want, as, as much as I'm managing all this around my day job, um, it is getting harder. <laughs> as things start to, you know, at the beginning of my property journey, I was like, I just want something to happen because I feel as if I'm just working in the day job constantly I need something to happen now things are happening properly I'm like right, I need a bit of a break from something here so it's getting the fine balance um, so the, the number one is I want to want to go full time in property be able to give up the day job um, in terms of my own strategy um, rent to SA is a great strategy cash flow just now it's not my long term strategy I want to I want to still have an SA portfolio but I'm looking to more get into buy TSA up in Scotland rather mm -hmm. than Cardiff. Um, I don't want to give up one job when I'm travelling the whole length of the country and, you know, I have my portfolio 400 miles away. Yeah. So I, I'm looking to, to do that. Um, and I'm also looking at some flips just now as well. I've got a couple of flips that I'm running the figures on for myself, um, which the money, you know, that I've made from sourcing these deals is going to go towards getting me in the door um, with them. So, and again, it's just more networking. I've, I, I do a lot of kind of networking with people in the tribe, um, how, I, how I kind of got, after I started Protégé, uh, way back at the very beginning, I was looking at people that were three, four, five, six months further down the line than I was. And back then, you know, Stephen and David Smith, you know, people like Chris mm. Dale, um, talking to them, finding out where they are and, and how they've got from where I am to where they are just now, um, mm. if you like. So I'll continue to do that. You know, I'll look at people who are further down the line from where I am just now speak to them and, and try and work, collaborate with them. Um, yeah. I've got a project, I've, I've put some money in with Chris DL actually and I flipped down to Newcastle. So again, it's just coll more collaborations. Um, yeah. And the, the opportunities are there in the tribe, as, as you well know. Absolutely. I love it. Collaborations is always great. And the people you've mentioned we've had on the podcast as well, which yes, is good. And yeah. something I always recommend people go and do is just watch the others in the in the podcast because like yourself here, Paul, it's just inspiring to hear someone's journey. You know, and uh, you're still very early on in yes. your property journey, but you are in some way leaps years ahead from someone like myself that gets started. <laughs> um, can you believe it? It's almost 20 years ago. Um, but when I get started with no education, with no real knowledge and try to figure all this out and all the limiting beliefs you could possibly imagine and everybody tell me that I shouldn't be doing it, yep. but just pursued on that journey. And this is what I love about, you know, uh, yourself and many others looking through the program is that you know that the giving you that support and help through the knowledge you guys did the work though you yeah. guys did the work you've done the work and you're getting the rewards for it and it's just going to you know where you're going to be a year from now it, it yeah. gets 
me excited it should get you excited too <laughs> it does yes I, especially now when you see things start to happen and especially when you sit and reflect on what you've done I, I mentioned earlier on you know I, sometimes I, I don't give myself enough credit for, for what you've done and you think you know comparison is, is the thief of joy as they say because you're looking at what other people are doing and thinking oh they're doing more than me but sometimes you just need to take a step back and, and look at what you've done yourself and yeah. you know it, it does get you excited for, for, for what's to come there was a quote that I, I read that you said it was a game changer for you. Yes. Do you remember that one? Yes. Don't be so busy making a living that you forget to make a life. So that is so profound. Yeah, yeah. And it's it really stuck with me. And it's when I was working away from home an awful lot pre-COVID. Um, I was working away from home probably Monday to Thursday, Monday to Friday some weeks. You know, my daughter was two or three at the time. Um, I missed so much, but in my mind, I was doing the right thing because I was building my career to, you know, to try and earn more money, to being in sales, to hit my bonus and all this kind of stuff. Um, and someone said to me, you know, you're doing all this, you know, making a living, but don't forget you want to make a life as well. And it really struck a chord with me. And I'm like, you know, what's more important? Do my kids want to see that I've got money in the bank because I've, you know, I've earned, you know, some good commission this month? Or they want me there to be able to go to parents' night or to go to take, drop them off at nursery and all this kind of stuff, you know. So uh, that really struck a chord with me. And uh, it's kind of one of the key things that made me think, of what can I do to get out of this? Um, and obviously we had the flat. We could see what we could do in property. Um, and it was kind of one of the kind of motivating factors for me to, to really start to get in more involved in property and try and get out of what I was doing. Yeah. I'm glad that was a trigger because look what you've done in less than a year and a half. It's just remarkable. Yeah. And it's still very early doors in your journey. It is, yeah, still early on, yeah. And yeah. it's exciting to see what you're going to do with that. So going forward, if anybody was to reach out with you, how can people connect and reach out? Yeah, well, the Facebook, Instagram, Paul McKim Property on Instagram. Um, You can look me up, Paul McKim on Facebook. Um, my company's PMK Property Partners. Um, I've got a contact form on my, web my website or... Uh, yeah, yeah, just just reach out. Great stuff. It's been an absolute pleasure, Paul. Fantastic, Paul. Brilliant. Thank Good you. stuff. And as always, for you guys that are watching or listening, you know, if you've got any questions, pop it in the comments below. I'm sure that Paul will be keeping an eye on and be able to respond, likewise myself. And of course, I'll link off in the show notes to Paul so you can connect with him as well. So my goal, as always, is to help you guys on your journey by inspiring you with great guests on their journey so they can hopefully help you on your journey too. So until next time, all the best and bye for now.